Bible says when the enemy comes in, like a flood, the Lord will lift up a standard against the enemy. I really want to speak to today about the Holy Spirit and us as a believer. How the, the Holy Spirit is there to help us. Many times when we talk about the Holy Spirit, we talk about the Holy Spirit from the context of speaking in tongues and some people that's as far as they go is just having an understanding that when I speak in tongues I receive the Holy Spirit and not really under having an understanding of how the Holy Spirit operates in our lives and how important we must have the Holy Spirit amen we must have the Holy Spirit in our lives if we're gonna be if we're going to have any breakthrough and any success in our lives, it is the Holy Spirit in our lives as believers that gives us that breakthrough. I, I, I'm one of these believers. I Sometimes when I speak, I get myself in a lot of trouble because I've always been around strong, mature people. So I, I, I get, I am challenged when anything is less than that. That's my norm. My norm is just tough. That's, that's my norm. So anything less than that is a struggle for me because I don't, I, don't be, I don't believe in weak Christians. I don't believe in, in, in Christianity going up and down like a roller coaster. So I struggle with anything like that. That's just a struggle to me. Because when you really allow the Holy Spirit in your life, we're supposed to be consistent. We're supposed to have breakthroughs. But that is not to negate that we are in a spiritual battle. The reason I mentioned you before, the reason why we're in a spiritual battle is because you're carrying a plan in your heart. You're carrying divine purpose. Paul puts it this way, you've got treasures that's buried in earthen vessel. You are carrying something. You have potential to make things happen. You have potential to change your whole entire family. I don't care if your whole family are non-Christians. The Bible says that God says in Isaiah that he will not crush the cluster of grapes because there is a blessing in there. All you need is one person in your family to be saved and it can change the whole entire family. So I've been to baptism where people um, have been threatened that if, if, if they get baptized, the family's coming for them and going to kill them and all that kind of stuff. And they, they're just still resistant and resilient and say, I'm getting baptized. Because I believe that when you have one person you can change the whole entire history of your family. I don't care if you say, well, my family weren't raised in church. My family's not a very good family. My family this. All it takes is one person. And you can change the history of your family. <clears throat> I've seen what the power of the Holy Spirit can do. Because I've seen what the Holy Spirit has done in my life. And I've watched and see how the, it's just amazing when you see people, and I've, I've been around a long time, over 40 odd years in church, and I've watched some very rough people come in, very hard. I've, we've worked with, with crime people, you know, some real tough people. We don't want to go into the history, but we've, we've dealt with all of them. And it's amazing what happens when the Holy Spirit comes into a person's life and enters a person's life it doesn't matter how bad they are it doesn't matter what their history was God has this ability incredible ability to bring a change to people's lives you can never be so bad and so hard that God can't change you we used to have some men who used to come to the church because we used to when we used to preach and the women used to get saved and the men got suspicious their boyfriends got suspicious about what is going on down in the church and they used to come down ready armed ready to fight with us and they will come and they will stand up at the back of the church and some of them it was so funny they wouldn't be seated if you ask them to be seated they wouldn't be seated they will stand with their backs against the walls and they will have their tools ready with them and they will come and each week they will stand at the, on the wall they have their knife they have everything and they will just stand at the back of the wall but as the word of God goes forth and as the ministry of the Holy Spirit goes forth and you see those lives being changed and you see them come and accept, it, accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and then they join the team 
And they're the ones who start to do instruments and pick up, because we used to have to pick up instruments. And you see what God can do in a person's life. So I want to share uh, quickly seven things that the Holy Spirit will do in our lives. More than just speaking in tongues, I believe totally in the speaking in tongues. I absolutely believe in that. But there is more than just speaking in tongues that the Holy Spirit wants to do in your life. So I want to give you seven key things in, a, in, in about 30 minutes, if I can, very quickly, what the Holy Spirit will do in your life. Someone say amen. So I'm going to give some scriptures that will help us in terms of understanding all these are scriptural base. And so I, will, I want to invite your attention over to Romans chapter 8. Father, we give you praise. And just for time, there's quite a lot of reading because it talks about when we receive... Father, we give you praise. And just for time, there's quite a lot of reading because it talks about when we receive Jesus Christ and it says, therefore, there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who's verse number one, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And then it begins to talk about the life of the Spirit within a man. That we must understand that when you receive the Holy Spirit, there is going to be a conflict in your life. You're going to have a conflict between your old nature and your new nature. You're going to have a tug of war between your flesh and your spirit. Your flesh is going to want to do its own thing. You are a big man, you are a big woman, you make your own decisions, you do your own thing. Many of us are independent, we do our own, we, we just make our own decision. That's been led by our flesh. Our flesh is our desires. Our flesh is our passion. Whatever makes us happy is what we do. That's called the flesh. But when you come to Christ, the Bible speaks about we are no longer under the control of flesh, which is called the carnal nature, which is your fleshly mindset, how you think. We are now operating by the Spirit, the Spirit of God. So the Spirit of God begins to start leading us. And so what happens is you get a conflict sometimes between the flesh saying, I want to do my thing, and your spirit that wants to do something else. So Paul begins to give us our understanding in verse number 14. So when you read Romans chapter 8, verse 1 right through, it speaks about that, uh, that verse 7 talks about the, the, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subjected to the law of God, neither can it be. I need to let you understand that. There is a reason why God makes a separation between us as Christians um, linking up in covenant with someone who is not a Christian. Because what he talks about, there is two separate laws. When you're under the law of the flesh, it means as long as you are not breaking the rules of the country, you can do whatever you want to do, and as long as the law permits it, it's okay. Do you hear me? That's the law of the country. We're in a country that you can do whatever you want to do. As long as you don't break the laws of, of the land, you can do whatever you want. That is that law. When you are a Christian, you come under a different set of laws. You are ruled differently. Your mindset is differently. So you can't take someone who is of a carnal nature and try to put them under our law. It's not going to happen unless there's a transformation that takes place in their lives. There's always, you're going to always have a problem because it's two separate laws. So Paul in verse 7 just clarifies and says, the carnal mind is an enmity, is a problem. When you have a carnal thinking, when we use carnal, we say fleshly thinking, trying to deal with a spiritual matter, you're going to have a problem. 
Carnality and spirituality will always clash. Are you hearing me? What you do in your flesh and what you do in the spirit is always going to clash. It's always going to collide. So how do I deal with that area of my life when I want to do what I want to do? But the Bible is telling me something different. How do I deal with the conflict that happens in a Christian's life? We all have this conflict. Every one of us sitting there are going to have some kind of, of conflict between my flesh and my spirit. Well, verse number 14 helps us in terms of understanding how the Holy Spirit works in our lives. In verse number 14, the Bible says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. I want you to note that very carefully. For as many as are led please understand that the holy spirit what the work of the holy spirit is to lead you to christ the work of the holy spirit is to lead you to christ please understand i use the word lead and he does not force and that's why people get in conflict that says well if i know that i'm a thief well, how comes the Holy Spirit didn't stop me from stealing if he knows that I'm a thief? Because the Holy Spirit can never force you. It would only lead you. To force means to go against your will. The Holy Spirit will not go against your will. You have to bow your will to the will of God. That's why some people say, well, if God comes down and tell me himself, he's done that. He's done that. You're waiting for God to do what he's already done. So some people don't understand. They say, well, why there is so much crimes in the world? Why is there so much problems in the world? Because every single one of us have been given the choice to, to, to use our will. God will never force you to do anything. So in other words... I can leave this pulpit today and I can go and commit the most horrendous crime. Why? Because it's an act of my will. The Holy Spirit is not going to stand in front of me and try to hold me and force me back. Because if he forced me, he's going against my will. And every one of us has the ability to make choices. That's why the Bible says, the Lord says, I, I put before you life and death life and death i counsel you to choose life but at the end of the day you i've given you the power to make a choice i advise you to use to choose life but at the end of the day you make the decision the holy spirit will never force you do you hear me he will never force you. He will never put your arms behind your back and force you. You have to be led. In order for someone to lead you, it means you have to submit. Then you can follow. Are you with me today? You have to submit and then follow. Now, will the Holy Spirit set up some things for you? He sure will. Because sometimes you've got to understand some of us are, we are so stiff-necked and we are so stubborn that sometimes God would have to put us through some stuff so that we can come bow our knees and say, Lord, I surrender because I ain't going to win against you. And that's what he does sometimes to us. Sometimes, I know in my own life, sometimes I'm so stubborn so stubborn because i want to do my thing i want to see what everybody else is doing i want to do my thing and so sometimes god will be saying delroy i want to get your attention but you ain't listening to me son because i'm busy doing my stuff and say delroy i told you i want to get your attention because i want you to become a preacher i want you to preach my gospel but i want to do my thing but sometimes things will happen and God will do certain things to get our attention. Just like the fishermen who've been fishing. And they're fishing and they're skilled fishermen. They know what they're doing. But you know what? All night they've been toiling. They've been fishing all night. And God was saying, 
Because boys, I want to get your attention. But they're too busy fishing. And you know what God does? Take all the fish and direct them in a different direction. And they fish all night. And there's nothing worse than when you fish all night and you come back and you've got nothing to show for your hard work. And the Lord says, have you got anything? We've been fishing all night and we've got nothing. And the Lord says, okay, because I want to get your attention, now I've got your attention, watch this. Throw your net on the other side. Now, if you're a skilled person and you know your craft and someone who is not a fisherman, Jesus is a carpenter, is his skill. A carpenter telling a fisherman what to do don't, doesn't go well. It doesn't go well. A carpenter don't tell a fisherman how to fish. But they said, nevertheless, ain't too happy about this, but nevertheless, at your will, because you because you told me to do this, we're going to go and get all our nets again. We're going back out and we're going to cast our net on the other side. When they cast the net on the other side, all the fishers were waiting for them. What was that all about? It's simply the Lord saying, I'm trying to get your attention. I'm trying to get your attention because I have something for you to do and I can't force my way into your life. I can't force myself upon you. So what I have to do is get your attention so that you will now submit to me. So sometimes God puts us in situations that allows us to cry out to him. Have you ever been in a situation where no one else can help but him? Have you ever been there when nothing else, no one else, you, you just know this is really between me and God? And then I, I, I'm going to preach this in, in Easter for Easter service, because there's some things, there's certain, there's a certain cry that God hears. There's a certain prayer that when you pray, God hears that prayer. There's a certain, you know like when you have a child and you hear that cry, a mother knows her child. Because we, we got, um, yesterday, my, my nephew, his wife has got triplets, and they were here yesterday. And all three, I can't work out which one's which. I'm trying to say, well, where's the distinguishing features? And it's like, uh, the, the grandmother was saying, she waits for her son to call out one of the names, and she calls out the name as well, say, yeah, that's, that's the one. Because we can't work out which one's which. But a mother could know the difference in the cry. There's a certain cry that this child has, which is different from this one. Mothers, you know that. What, what used to happen is when at home, even the way how we walk up the stairs, my mum will know is me. Because sometimes I know she wants a cup of tea. And so you're trying to walk up the stairs. That right? It's like, oh man, how do you know? There's, there's certain things is programmed, a certain cry, a certain sound that you just know. So God has this way of with us he will never force himself upon us but there is a when you come into covenant that's what we're going to talk about when we come into covenant with god it gets god's attention and so there's certain things that god has to set up in your life there's certain things that's happening all god wants you to do is submit to him he will never force you to serve him and if anyone tell you that god forced me it's a lie. God will never force you. But what he will do, he will lead you by the Spirit of God to, to, towards Christ. For as many that are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Which tells me not everybody is led. The reason is because not many people will follow. So there are, there are still people who will use a disguise as being a Christian, but they cannot be led. The old school used to say, the old school used to say, sheep can be led, but on our goat, <laughs> goat can't lead. You know, in other words, let me explain. Sheep, you can lead a sheep, but goats, they just do their own thing. And the more you try to correct them, they're going to turn on you, and they will, they will hurt you. 
So as many that are led, so the first thing that the Holy Spirit is going to do in your life, he's going to lead you towards Christ. He's not going to lead you to anything that's destructive. He's always going to lead you towards Christ. Someone say amen. amen. The reason why he leads us towards Christ is that so that we can get to a place where we can receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and our personal Savior. The Bible says in John 1 and verse 12, but as many as received him. So in other words, he leads us. So some of us are saying, I don't want to be a Christian yet because Christianity is about giving up too much stuff. I'm not ready to give up all my stuff. I still need to, I still got plenty of time. I want to do my own thing. So what happens is when you receive the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit starts leading you towards Christ. When he starts leading you towards Christ, then what you've got to do at some point, you've got to get to a point where you say, I receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and personal Savior. We do that through the act of baptism. Because through baptism, we seal that covenant to say, this is what God has been doing in my life. He's been calling me, and now I have accepted him. It's my choice. It's my free will. I choose. No one put a gun to my head and told me I have to come to church and worship. It's my choice. It's my free will. It's called love. Someone say love. love. And you see, how I express my love is through my free will. I'm here because of my free will. So as many that have received Christ or received him, to them he gave power to become the sons of God even to them that believe on his name. So the first work of the Holy Spirit, when you receive the Holy Spirit in your life, the Holy Spirit is going to lead you towards having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen? The second... Galatians 5 and verse number 22. It says this, But the fruit... Of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self control. Against such there is no law. So, in other words, when you receive the Holy Spirit, there should be evidence and the evidence is the fruit that is manifested from your life if you put a tree in a garden and you tell me that this tree is an apple tree and every season i'm looking at this tree and i don't see no apple you lie someone's giving you someone's someone's flogged you up someone's done something wrong because if you say this is an apple tree I'm supposed to see some fruits. I'm supposed to see some apples. If you say it's a pear tree, I'm supposed to see pears. If you say it's a mango tree, I'm supposed to see a mango. If you say you're Christian, I'm supposed to see some fruits. I know you ain't going to say amen to me. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. So the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit comes into your life, you are going to become fruitful. You cannot be in, you cannot have the Holy Spirit and you are empty and you avoid something's wrong. There's a deception somewhere along the line. If you receive the Holy Spirit, there will be fruit. You will be fruitful. Did you hear me? You will be fruitful. Now, let's break this down just a little bit. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit, I don't know why it didn't say fruits. It said fruit, not with an S, plural, singular. The fruit of the Spirit contained in there is your ability to love. So if I struggle with love, it simply means I need more Holy Spirit. That's what it means. It means the Holy Spirit is draining, is leaking. 
I need a top up. Fruit of the Spirit, love, joy. If you're always miserable, you can't smile. That means you're void of some joy. Mm -hmm. I didn't say happiness, I said joy. Happiness is based upon circumstance. Happiness says, if I got this, then I'll be happy. If I get a car, I'll be happy. If I get a job that pay me a hundred thousand, I'll be happy. If I go to holiday in Barbados, <laughs> I'll be happy. <laughs> it's based upon condition. Joy is not based upon condition. Joy is a fruit of the Spirit. It comes from the Spirit of God. It is not based upon circumstance. So it doesn't mean that everything, I've got everything wonderful. Because sometimes people look at the Christian and say, Oh, it's alright for you, Pastor. You don't have no problems. No, that's not, what, that's not what it is. That's based upon happiness. Joy is based upon my relation. The joy of the Lord becomes my strength. It's two different things. So if you're short in terms of joy if you're always waiting for conditions to be right before you're happy and before you smile then you kind of miss it because the spirit of the lord will, will give you joy to sustain you even in difficult times you can go through some very difficult hard times and you can still have a smile you can still rejoice because the joy of the lord sustains you through some very hard times. You have peace, long suffering, long suffering. How long is long? You have kindness, goodness, faithfulness. Faithfulness is a fruit of the Spirit. So if we are unfaithful, then it means you need more topping up with the Holy Spirit. We need to be faithful. Faithfulness is a fruit that is manifested from the Spirit of God. Gentleness. Gentleness. Self-control. So if you pray, I couldn't help it. I can't help it. It means you need more Holy Ghost. Because you... You got to know how to control your emotions. You got to know how to control yourself. There's times, that's why I said there's a, a conflict between your flesh and your spirit. Who wins the battle the most? Is it your flesh or is it your spirit? If it's more of your flesh, that means you need more of the Holy Ghost. Because when you, when you have more of the Holy Ghost, you're able to control yourself better. It's not everything you have to give into and say, well, no one stop me. The Holy Spirit ain't going to stop you. It's about having self-control, learning how to say no. But pastor, the temptation was there. I got tempted and I had to do it. I just had to do it. No, it means you don't have enough Holy Ghost. When you have Holy Ghost inside of you, you learn how, you know how to say no. Someone say no. no. Come on, say no. no. So the next time the devil starts coming with his foolishness, learn how to say no. Because it's an act of your will. It's because you have submitted to the Holy Spirit. So when the devil comes with foolishness, you simply say, no, behave yourself, back up and go. I've got to get on with my things. That's simply how it is. Self-control is not everything you have, to, you have to give in to, and then you have to come and repent afterwards. It's called self-control. Amen. So the Holy Spirit will cause you to become fruitful. How fruitful are you in your life? Is there evidence? Is there any evidence that can convict you that you have the Holy Spirit? If we were to go to the court of laws and they were to cross-examine you, 
Is there enough evidence in your life to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that you have the Holy Spirit? Is there enough? Because there's so much evidence. I can't say I'm not a Christian because there's too much evidence. I've got way too much evidence. But do you have enough evidence where people can look at you and just say, I don't even have to ask you if you're a Christian. I don't even have to ask you because there's so much evidence that is there. And sometimes you don't even have to open your mouth. It's just the way how you behave. You don't even have to open your mouth. It's the way how you behave. They used to say to us in, in the early days when I was a young guy growing up in church that they said, when you receive the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit would even teach you how to dress. Because I've gone into some shops and I see the fashion, I see some jeans and I'm thinking, I like them. And I look at and the Holy Spirit, what, what are you doing? <laughs> it may look nice on that brother, but he ain't going to be right on you. The Holy Spirit will speak to you. There's certain things I can't wear. There's certain places everybody else can run to. You ain't running there. You know why? Because you are led by the Spirit of God. You can't just follow anything. And so we want to see in our lives you become fruitful. It don't happen overnight. You develop. You, when you look at the tree, the fruit don't turn up overnight and it just turn up. So, sorry. The, the fruit just don't... See what you guys are doing to me, man? It's... You don't, you don't see the fruit overnight. It's a process. So as a Christian, there's a process. We need time to develop. There's some things I don't, I'm not strong in. So what happens is I have to develop. Are you hearing me? So if you're a person who can't suffer long, then you know what? It, there's that process of developing. But we must know that as a Christian, we must become fruitful someone say amen. amen the third thing the holy spirit would do when you receive the baptism of the holy spirit and you receive the holy spirit into your life we find that in ephesians chapter 3 and verse number 16 ephesians 3 and verse number 16 this is what the holy spirit will do in your life Ephesians chapter 3 and verse number 3 and verse number 16. And this is what it says. That he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. If I can put it this way, it is the Holy Spirit that gives your spirit the strength to face whatever you have to face. Each of us in this room have had to face some challenge. Sometimes it's in the health, sometimes it's in our finances, sometimes it's in our family. Some, some of you will leave here and this week you're gonna be, you'll be challenged. And you say, how am I going to deal with the challenges that I face? Well, what happens is the Holy Spirit will then strengthen your spirit. So that whatever you have to face, please understand 
that he will not necessarily take you out of a situation. That's what people have to, you have to understand. So if I'm going to face a problem in my family, I might be praying and say, God, take me out of this problem. He might be saying, I ain't taking you out of this problem. But Lord, I'm facing financial difficulty. I'm facing health difficulty. I'm facing relationship difficulty. I'm facing all these difficulties and they seem to be greater than me. So when you're praying, you say, Lord, how are you going to help me? It says, I'm going to sustain you right where you are. And that's why some people get an attitude with God because they want him to take him out. And he's saying, no, I'm not taking you out. I'm going to stand with you through it. And so what I'm going to do, I'm going to place my strength upon your strength. In other words, I'm going to give your spirit strength. So whatever trials you face, you will go through it. Whatever challenge you face, you will go through it. So the Holy Spirit is more than just speaking in tongues. Because every one of us is going to need extra strength. And so the, 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 the work of the Holy Spirit is to give us strength that we can face whatever we have to face. That's the Holy Spirit. So that means, huh, are you hearing me? Just give me a little bit more on this, Irie. That means that I don't want to be hearing people telling me the devil was too strong. That means we should not be experiencing the kind of failures that sometimes we experience, we shouldn't be having it. I can't be having a believer who's mature keep telling me you're getting beaten up by the devil all the time. Some, you, that means this, you will violate the scripture. That something's gone wrong because you're supposed to have the power to deal with everything that comes your way. I didn't say everything's easy. Because some of us have to face some very difficult thing. So when we face in difficulties, what we are praying is more of the Holy Spirit being poured into my life that will give me the strength to deal with whatever I have to deal with. So as a church, sometimes we have to deal with some very hard things. So you know what we do? We want more Holy Spirit. Because the more Holy Spirit that comes in is the stronger we are going to become. And so what happens is you get to a place where your faith is so strong that you ain't, you ain't waiting for the devil to come to you. You're, 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 you want to fight. You're, you're, you're looking for problems. You're looking for challenges. Because you know what happens? You are strong in him. You have strength. So you're not a little weak Christian. I'm in my small corner and you in yours. Mm -mm. Not when you're... Not when you receive the Holy Spirit. When you receive the Holy Spirit, you have to understand, the righteous are as bold as lions. Wicked people, wicked, the wicked flees when no one is pursuing them. Let me push on. So the Holy Spirit gives our spirit the strength to deal with any problems. So if you're facing a problem at work, before you send fire on them, go and pray and ask God to increase your strength. Because some of us are so feeble, we, we cry at everything. Someone didn't like us, someone didn't talk nice to us, someone didn't smile at us, and we're so emotionally feeble that I, I, a preacher said, could you imagine when we meet up with those who have gone before, and those who were killed and persecuted, those who were like Paul, sorry, Peter and them, who were stoned for their faith. And they said, well, what trials did you go through? Because we were, we were hunted by lions, and they set lions on us, and we had to flee, we had to fly, climb over walls and run through troops. What did you do? Well, they didn't like me. They didn't, they, I came to church and no one, no one greeted me. You know, could you imagine they sharing their testimony? 
how they tie one hand and one foot to one horse, one hand and one foot to the other horse, and say, we want you to denounce knowing Jesus Christ. And they said, we will never denounce. And they ripped them in half. And then we said, what are you here for? Because no one smiled at me. I gave up my faith. I'm not coming to church anymore because no one... What? And people got killed for their faith. And you're talking about no one said hello to me. No one phoned me. No one called me. And so I'm not coming to church anymore. And there are people who are dying. People who are being... ISIS are c cutting off Christians' head. They're cutting off Christians' head beheading them for their faith and they and there's men and women who will not give up and now they're taking it to the next level they're putting people in cages and setting them on fire and when that don't hit, hit the headline anymore they're taking it to the next level these are attacks that's coming against christians and you're talking about no one smiled at me and i ain't coming to church anymore listen there is a wave, I'm preparing us, there is a wave of persecution that's coming to the church. It's going to be more than just clapping hands and less singing and less dancing. You need to have something on the inside of you because it's coming. It's part of prophecy. Christians are going to be persecuted for their faith. You better know, you, you better know your stuff because it's coming and it's coming soon. I don't, want, I don't even want to frighten you because you ain't ready for it yet. <laughs> you guys ain't ready for what's really coming, what's coming upon the church. And that's why we're trying to prepare the church. God says, I want a bride without spots or wrinkle. I need my bride to be ready. But the church is sleeping. The church has been in a coma because we've had to focus so much on people. We're forgetting our assignment. Lord have mercy. If we don't pamper people, we can't get them to come back to church. And you don't understand, this assignment we have, it's heavy. This assignment, you got inside of you the Holy Spirit. You're carrying around the assignment. You may be one who's called to pray to save a whole entire family or community. You may be the key. That they're waiting on your prayers to unlock heaven so someone in the community could be saved. You could be the one responsible for the life and death of a community. And so if you ain't got it right, and when it's time to pray, you're watching TV, a whole community could die because you weren't on your post. So I'm trying to get us to understand that the Holy Spirit is more than this. Well, I spoke in tongues and so I, I'm on my way to heaven now. And I fold my arms and I'm, I'm ready to go to glory. No, there's an assignment. Church, listen to me. I'm going to finish here. There is an assignment on the church that is so huge. Let me see. Yeah. It's so huge that prophets are being raised up. And they ain't happy because their message is not a message of you're going to get a new car. We're, we're picking things up in our spirits that we don't really know how to articulate it yet. Because the church ain't ready to hear the true message. And so prophets and apostles are sitting in the wings and they're waiting. And these ain't your popular people. These ain't your people, your TV people that's going to come and, and, you know, tell you, yeah, by tomorrow you're going to have a new husband, a new wife, just so a thousand pounds in the offering. No, 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 no. This is, this is, there's stuff we're picking up. The things we're picking up in the spirit that is causing a great concern both in America and both in this country. And those of us who, who operate in a prophetic, we wish this would just go away. We wish we, wish we could just put the quilt over our head and just go to sleep. But it's scaring us in the sense that, Lord, the church seriously needs to awake because the church is sleeping. We're sleepwalking right into... Even though we've seen it on TV, we're, we're just sleepwalking. We're just sleepwalking. And we're, 
there's a calling, especially in my life, I'm calling the apostles and prophets. Because we're about, this country is about to encounter an onslaught. An onslaught we have never seen before. Please hear me. Church is more than, you see all this, thing, this, this will be filled. There ain't even a problem. It's just that people at the moment, they think it's austerity. And then, you know, we, we just want to get our money, want to get our homes. They, they have no idea. They're sleepwalking. This ISIS is growing to a point where it's a state. Are you hearing me? They are now, they get taxes that's been sent to them. That's funding their stuff. They're becoming so huge and so big. Whilst our country is cutting back on defenses, these people are investing and getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And you know who they're heading for? The Christians. But we want song and dance. And that's all we're doing, just making merry. And the church ain't ready. And so for those of us who are called in the prophetic and in the apostolic, we are concerned because the question is, are we ready? That's my concern. Are we, are we ready for what is about to take place? And so it weighs heavily on our heart. I told you, the amount of time I keep saying to the Lord, give me some happy sermons to preach. I want to preach some happy sermons. People come and they get happy and, and go home. But that's not my assignment. Because you would not appreciate it when time comes. And you say, Pastor never prepared us for this. We sang, we, we danced. It's like a parent. When a parent is supposed to prepare their children for when they have to set up on their own. But we're too busy being best friends. So now when you move into your house, you haven't got a clue. Can't cook. Can't fry the egg. Can't cook the traditional dinner. I'm not talking about chips and mushy peas. <laughs> I'm talking about the traditional idol dinner. Can't entertain more than three people. You're, you're panicking. Can't, can't. So what happens is later on, then you look and you say, parents never prepared us for this. But some of us who are parents disciplined us. And we weren't happy, but they disciplined. Now we're looking back and say, thank God. God, we are pre because they know how to do things. They know how to look after themselves. Now you appreciate it later. I'm hoping that's what I will do. Some of the things I preach, you may not appreciate it yet. But one thing you will know with Pastor Dell that when the enemy comes, you know how to whip him. <laughs> that's what I'm. That's what I'm talking about. I'm not worried if I'm not popular. That's fine. But as long as you who sit under my leadership. When the devil comes, you say, I don't know what to do, I don't know. No, 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 whip him. Say, so I've been taught, whip him. And any other friends he comes with, whip them as well. Whip them as well. I may not be popular, but I'm setting you for your future. That no one sit under my leadership don't know what to do. Because when the time comes, you prepared. You know what would happen? You know when you go through the, the, the army, they train and they train and they train. And sometimes they get frustrated because it's always, you're trainers and they're, you know, imaginary, imaginary battles. And they go through the same routines till it get boring. And then these are the same people that when it happened for real, they said, how did you do it? It's the training. The training prepared us for this. But at the time when you're doing the training, it's just like, oh, we've got to go through this again. Oh, Pastor, do we have to have another week of prayer? We just prayed last time. And we, we fasted before. Do we have to do this? Yes. You keep doing it until now it becomes second nature. Whip anything that comes in your way. Anytime when they come with foolishness and people try to deceive you, they try to trick you with scriptures and with thoughts and with philosophy, you go back to the word and say, it is written. Lord have mercy. Please stand. I'm finished. I'm over my time. Oh, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Will you stand and just lift your hands in the air? Holy Spirit.